My name's Mike Baker. I'm the Beef Cattle Extension Specialist with the Department of Animal Science at Cornell University. In part one, we looked at the live animal characteristics to determine when an animal is ready for harvest. In this second video, we're going to look at cattle as they hang on the rail at a packer. We can use our projections uh, when they're live, but the real value is when they're hanging in the cooler. Now, just like a live animal where we have a certain areas that we look at to determine its degree of readiness or degree of fatness, on the carcass, we have key areas that we focus on to help us evaluate the quality of the carcass in terms of eating quality, but also the quantity of the carcass in terms of yield. These carcasses are part of a project that I am working with farmers to try to estimate the value of the carcass and then go back and look at animal characteristics. So what can they change genetically, management-wise, to reduce the amount of variation so it's profitable for both the farmer and the packer? So the first area we look at is the internal fat, KPH, or kidney pelvic heart fat. This internal fat is important to have from the animal standpoint, but there's a lot of variation from animal to animal, and if there's a lot of fat in that kidney pelvic heart area, it's a wasteful animal, both in terms of quantity and to a certain extent quality. The next area, this is the ribeye area. Carcass has been split between the 12th and 13th rib, and what we're measuring here is the back fat. It's an indicator of the fatness of the entire carcass, and so three quarters of the way down the rib, we use a tool, folks that do this on a daily basis can eyeball it pretty close but in this animal we're looking at a lot of fat you can visually see that there's a lot of fat on that ribeye in fact it measured nine tenths of an inch just as a reference point most cattle feeders are looking to send animals to harvest between three tenths and five tenths of an inch so we've got an idea of the fatness next we wanted to get an idea of yield and the rib eye area is a pretty good indicator of total carcass yield. And so this is just a rib eye grid. Each dot represents a tenth of an inch. And so you essentially count all the dots and, and you come up with the rib eye area. In this case, the ribeye area is 10.1 square inches, and the importance of that is twofold. One, it needs to be large enough that the consumer gets the size steak that they want without having to cut it too thin or too thick, and then it also needs to fit various markets and needs to be sized right compared to the carcass. So for example, this ribeye area came out of a carcass that only weighed 668 pounds. So the proportion of ribeye area to carcass weight is 1.5. That'll range from 1.2 or 3 to over 2. Obviously larger numbers better. So this is kind of average to below average relative to carcass size. The next measurement is an indicator palatability. We have two types of fat. We have the taste fat, if you will, and the waste fat. The first measurement was on the ribeye. Recall that this uh, carcass had nine tenths of an inch. That's the waste fat. This carcass will be trimmed down to at least a quarter of an inch, maybe less. So there's almost a seven tenths of an inch that has to be removed. So very wasteful. However, the taste fat is that intermuscular fat, the fat that's in the muscle itself and has a high correlation to eating satisfaction. That's rated from slight amount of intermuscular fat all the way up to slightly abundant. And this is one of the few animals that we see in the prime category. Nationally, only about 3 to perhaps certain times of the year, 4% of the cattle will, will grade prime. So this one's out of the ordinary, but it had a... a just made it into the slightly abundant or the prime category. So should eat well, just has too much fat. 
what we're looking at here is to try to, to, to correlate back to the live animal. And so this is the area of the brisket. Remember, it was a fairly distinguishable characteristic on the live animal. And you can see that amount of fat that is in that area. So that's on the carcass. You remember what it looked like on the live animal. This is the area where the tailhead fat would be. Again, well-finished animals will have large bulges of tailhead fat. And this is what it looks like. You can see it's peeled back a significant amount, so there's a, a fair amount of, of fatness on this animal. Okay, this is our second carcass, and you can see on the tag that this one weighs 643 pounds. The market target, if you will, uh, is going to be 650 to 850. That's the range on a carcass weight that most consumers and most retailers are looking for. This one at 643 is kind of at the bottom end of the range. Again, we're looking at the internal or the KPH, kidney pelvic heart fat. This one had a level of 2.5% of the carcass, which is about average. We move then to measuring the back fat. Again, we do this three quarters of the way up the ribeye area. Think about that previous carcass we just looked at and this one, and, and it's quite visually obvious that this one has a lot less fat. And in fact, the measurement was three tenths of an inch. We're going to measure the ribeye, again counting the dots. Now recall that the ribeye on the first animal we looked at was 10.1 square inches on a carcass that weighed 668. This one is 12.7 on a lighter weight carcass. So the ratio of ribeye area to carcass is much higher and consequently should yield better than that previous one not only because it's got a larger ribeye, but it also has less fat that has to be removed. The biggest problem, and it's not a terrible problem, as you see that the amount of intramuscular fat, uh, the taste fat, is quite reduced from the first carcass. Now the correlation between back fat and intramuscular fat is positive. That is, as one goes up, the other follows. But it's not perfectly one. In fact, genetics has as much an influence on intramuscular fat as does the environment, that is the, the nutrition and feeding program. And so while this one had less back fat, it still fits into the low choice category. And generally that's where eating satisfaction increases. And so the prediction would be, or the expectation would be that this ribeye should still be very palatable, uh, even though the marbling is less than the first one we looked at. Again, for reference, this is the brisket area that we're looking at on the carcass. And you can see that there is a, definitely a bulge there of, of a fat deposit. Looking at the tailhead fat, not as strong. In fact, you can see on the hip area there, a little more lean tissue. So followed through on the carcass as it would have in the live animal. Our third carcass, number three, weighed 806 pounds, so we've moved up in the range. Looking at the KPH, or the kidney pelvic heart fat, again, two and a half as the other carcasses have been. So more of it, but it's measured as a percentage of the carcass, so about two and a half percent. Back fat, the actual measurement came out to seven tenths. So a little fatter than the target. Recall that we're looking for animals to be three and five tenths of an inch of back fat. Ribeye area, recall that this was a big carcass, 806 pounds, but the ribeye area is small, 10.9. Now it's adequate for consumers, uh, not a problem that way, but in terms of you producing this carcass, it's not what you want because the ratio is 1.4. So we have a very heavy carcass with a 10.9 inch ribeye area which means it's small relative to the carcass. So total yield is going to be lower. Looking at the marbling, the, another positive about this carcass is that it will grade choice. So the choice grade goes from choice minus, which is low, average choice, which is average, and then high choice. So this would be an average choice carcass. So we would expect that the satisfaction would be higher. Looking at the brisket area, this one you can see is, is quite a bit larger than what we saw in the previous carcass. So you can imagine on the live animal that we would definitely have a cantaloupe-sized brisket. 
This is an interesting shot uh, that we haven't shown before, but it is looking at the brisket fat from the inside after the carcass has been split, and you can see the thickness of that fat. Now, while we know brisket as a cut has more fat in it than, than other cuts, a significant amount of this fat is going to have to be cut out to make it marketable. Tailhead fat. On this one, interestingly enough, it doesn't look like it's pronounced as the previous carcass, which could very well be. As I've said earlier, that not all animals deposit fat equally and in the same locations. So this one could have had a lot of brisket fat and not as much tailhead fat. All right, so our last car keeps going up in weight. This one weighed 843 pounds and is getting to the top end of what would be preferred in the, in the consumer market. KPH falls in line. Most KPH is going to be in that 2.5%. We'll see some get to 3, but this fits the pattern quite well. Measurement-wise, this was measured at 35 hundredths of an inch, so very much in the range that we're looking for for slaughter. Going to the ribeye area, very nice eye. When you count that out, it's 14 square inches, and when you compare that to the weight of the carcass, the ratio is 1.7, so very much much in the acceptable range of carcass weight to ribeye area. Marbling score, we've had some really good carcasses uh, in this evaluation. That's the luck of the draw, if you will. But this carcass will be in the mid-choice or average-choice range. Should be a good eating experience based on that alone. Brisket fat on the carcass, not as much as we saw in the previous carcass. It had seven-tenths of an inch. So a pretty good relationship, at least in these carcasses, of back fat to the brisket fat. Tailhead fat, again, maybe not as prominent, although if you look up there a little closer to where the tailhead region would be, I think it, it's a fair amount of fat there. As you've seen today looking at these carcasses, and, and mind you, we only looked at four, but the variation is extremely large. And that presents a challenge for those of, of you that are involved in direct marketing. These big, large operations, they can sort carcasses from one retailer or market to another but you know what you've got what you've got and you've got to sell what you've got so paying attention to genetics actually is, is pretty critical maybe even arguably more important on small uh, operations than it is in large because you're dealing directly with the consumer and uh, one bad response can lead to a lost market. And fortunately, we've got good tools to do that. Uh, the second is nutrition. Extremely important to feed these animals correctly. We can't do anything about the muscling for the most part, but we can do a lot about fat. And so getting animals too fat is costly for you because that has to be trimmed off. Fat is expensive to put on and feeding animals animals and harvesting them at a too light of amount of fat is not good because you have to have a certain amount for carcass quality and eating quality. So it's not just a, an easy game. And, and so going and working with your packer, having them rib these carcasses so you can take a look at them will go a long way. 